Hello, and welcome to the show. Today, we have a very special guest with us, Mr. William Mutt, the Chief Investment Officer and Founder of Grow Investment Group. William is a China-based multi-manager or multi-strategy, multi-asset management company. Mr. Ma has over 18 years of industry experience and is going to launch the first multi-strategy hedge fund and fund of fund, both onshore and offshore. He's also a member of CAIA, a global association of alternative investment professionals, and a committee member of SBAI, the standard setting body for the alternative investment industry. Before founding Grow Investment Corp., William was the CIO of Gopher Asset Management and NOAA Holding in PRC, being one of the largest wealth managers in the country. William, thank you for joining us today. Thank you, Evan. Good seeing you. We've known each other since like three years old. So everyone has 20 something experience in the market. Yeah, we, we go way back. We actually met back in the day when you were still working with Family Office. I guess it's a fund of fund advisory firm here in Hong Kong called Penjing Asset Management. I was on the IC of one of our first incubation funds, fund of funded at the time, and you were working with the team. So it's incredible to see you grow from strength to strength and uh, working on some new products um, and projects such as Grow. So happy to jump into that. So William, let's dive into the weeds while we're here. You and I, we get asked a lot about China. I'm based in Hong Kong, you're based in Shanghai, and you're bouncing back and forth. It's always still a question of, is it still uninvestable? We're seeing numbers start to turn around. Macro metrics are starting to look positive. Savings rates are coming down a little bit, and consumer demand is driving the economy in the right direction. Now, walk us through where we are in the cycle right now. Have we hit bottom yet or is there still some ways to go? Yep, sure. We have been investing in the China market for almost 20 years. There is always a cycle in terms of economy and investment strategy. And I'll start with the uh, macro outlook and then I'll talk about specific trend in the asset management industry and then uh, potentially some of the opportunity. We are a firm believer that actually we've passed the worst, in particular on the uh, real estate side. The correction is already done. Uh, although it would take at least another two to three years to finish the unfinished project to deleverage you know, the overall property deleverage sector, uh, the biggest hit in the um, industry would be one, the banks, because they are still yet to fully kind of like fully digest the NPL. Although our real estate sector as a percentage of bank loan is roughly 20%, so it would not kill them. But I think the bank will struggle a little bit on that side. And then the second negative impact would be to the um, so-called pseudo guaranteed product or some of the wealth management product being distributed in the last five to six years. And some of the product will be defaulted during this restructure process. But I think this too is well priced in or expected by the any master and client because the government has starting of the three red line has been doing that. And I think the most um, critical impact is about consumption and the wealth effect. So some of them have houses in tier one city or tier two city before in China over the last five, 10 years, they are seeing their mark to market of the real estate in a very high level. That's why they feel rich, they spend, and then they, they go consumption. And nowadays, I think over the last two years, people realize that some of their real asset or property has to be marked down or remain in the portfolio. In general, we are estimating that the high net worth and some of the richer individual, 70% 70, 70 of their asset is in the real estate sector, I mean in the real estate property. And hence, during this process, either they have to sell at a discount or realize that they are not as rich as before. So we believe this trend, we've seen it in Hong Kong and some of the global cities before. It would take a year or two for them to become more realistic, understand what's happening. But Elvin, if you remember back in 97, we are talking about negative equity in Hong Kong, right? So the good thing about China property market is the China retail, they are not using a lot of leverage in buying the property. So we do not have this type of negative equity phenomenon in the China market yet. So there is not much kind of forced selling or forced closure by the retail. So in short, I think um, the impact to the banking and the wealth management industry or some of the investors in those pseudo guarantee products will be rippled through in this year and next year. And then for the retail, they would struggle for another six months. But again, my view is it's all being priced in and reflected in the sentiment. That's why in terms of equity market, 
you are seeing a really bottom, from my perspective, third chip valuation because people are exaggerating how big the real estate you know, sector bubble be. So from growth perspective or from our client perspective, we do see opportunity. What the market needs is a pickup of confidence in terms of macroeconomic figures as well as uh, some of the business owner. And we are seeing green shoots and early indicators. Some of the business owner, they are starting to put back capex to the industry. So overall, I think most of the concern is being priced in for professional and alternative investors. It's time for us to do some shopping. Do you think that some of these issues that you mentioned, such as banks need to have the workout with NPLs, like you said, it's only about 20% of their real estate is only 20% of their balance sheet. Uh, similar to what happened in the U.S., you have the sort of semi-collapse of the regional banks. In the case of China, you have these provincial banks that are really feeling a lot of pain. I think the question is, from almost like a TA perspective, typically when we look at the bottom, we look at how the impact of bad news impacts the price action in the market. And we seem to be seeing a more and more muted effect as news starts to come out. Mm. Now, granted, China, where CSI were down, I think it's almost 10%. CSI 300, CSI 500, down roughly 6.5% or so year-to-date as the time of this recording. So, and this is on the back of three years of brutal COVID uh, sell-offs, right? And we didn't really see some of that recovery the way that we wanted to last year. So when we look forward and the equity markets, they say, look, six months ahead, you mentioned that we're priced in, but we could have some opportunities for pullbacks to to add to positions um, starting today. Is that a fair comment? Yes, depends on the investor portfolio and their mandate. I would say real estate related or this kind of like bottom fish opportunity, there is two asset classes or strategy. That makes sense because um, I think for investors who need liquidity, there is one direction. But investors can lock up their capital a little bit, like one to two years or three years plus, there is another set of opportunity. I'll start with the less liquid side in which because as you understand, Elvin, in distress environment, those who has the bullet, who has the cash, tends to have a more bargain hunting. You now, one strategy that we are seeing and actually we're doing and have achieved high double-digit return result is the so-called the operating asset remodeling in tier one cities in China. For example, last year, us and some of the big family office client and institutional investors, what they are doing, they are buying tier one hotels owned by some of the real estate developer. Very new, three years, five years at 30 to 50% discount. Some of them are foreclosure by the bank already. And then we remodeled it into a service apartment in Tier 1 city and then we rent it out. And then uh, after renting out, one of the recent projects we finished is in uh, Chihui Chu in Shanghai, which is the Xin Tandi area. It's the central, central kind of like downtown in uh, New York or in London. And within two weeks, it's all being rent out. So the demand for service apartment, you know, middle size is very high. So I would call this a counter cyclical strategy in which to pay through the real estate downturn and the distress opportunity in some of the developers and the banks want to liquidate part of the asset at a deep discount and for us to come in, remodel it, rent it out, and then we sell it to the global and local insurance companies. So this is counter cyclical, huge opportunity. And the second one is uh, back to the real estate sector or the listed stock, if you like. I don't think from my perspective, we should catch the life by long real estate stocks or some of the uh, real estate servicing company or some of the offshore real estate developers, US dollar bond. Because I think the risk reward is not that attractive. We are more focusing on the growth opportunity, the upside, if you like. And there is a lot of investor in those assets is being handcuffed. You know, once those stocks being rebound by 10, 20%, they will sell the stocks and then maybe mark to market some of their losses. So I think in terms of counter cyclical, we are seeing opportunity in the hard asset side. And then on the public market, we are seeing more opportunity in the uh, growth sector. For example, electric vehicle, supply chain, those from my perspective, um, there are more risk reward opportunity. Just going back to private sector for a second, and this is something we get asked a lot. I know both you and I, we work, most of our strategies are in the public securities, but there's a lot of rumblings where um, a lot of funds are being set up now to take advantage of these rock bottom prices in the private markets. What would you like to see? I mean, are we at the point right now where the private market has finished its workout valuations? Uh, when we say mark to market, usually, and just for the audience, typically with private equity, uh, you, 
you have this mismatch where investors or the investment managers hold the positions at cost from the day of inception straight through to harvest period, maybe five plus seven years. Now, those vintages that started in 2018, 2019 are still holding those positions at cost, need to have that re-rating or that repricing done. And of course, you have these uncomfortable discussions between auditors, LPs, and managers. So are we at the stage yet right now? We're seeing more and more, I wouldn't say distressed asset, but certainly forced liquidations of sorts where private equity investors could take real advantage. Yes, actually, I think we are seeing two trends on the private side. One now is a golden opportunity for global investor who did not have any private equity exposure in China to come in. And through a secondary market, we call it S fund, like some of the global secondary market, investing in the LP stake of the fund. So we are seeing some old early stage domestic family office investor that they are making two, three X of the money in the fund, but the fund is not fully liquidated. They're happy to give a deep discount and sell it. It's a time machine. So I think for global investor, it's a perfect time for them to build private equity secondary market exposure in China right now because people are willing to take some profit and sell. And um, the second point is I don't think for new private equity fund now is the opportunity because there is still some traffic congestion. <laughs> if you like, Elvin, that the IPO market in China, there is a lot of pipeline is being waited. So I think for general private equity fund, maybe it's still too early. And then the third is we are seeing some really unique trend, which is called corporate VC, CVC fund, in which in China, part of fund manager or owner is actually the leader in those respectable industry. For example, in opticals, in uh, car, or some of them in consumption. I think those uh, venture capital fund or PE fund, they are very deep in investing and early identifying some of the future winner. Like the recent example is the laser, electric vehicle car, right? You got the laser sensor. So some of those companies actually last two years was investing by some of these corporate VC fund. We're seeing similar opportunities. So from my perspective, for global investors at this point to invest in China on the illiquid side, it would be great for them to look at private equity secondary as well as really specific, unique corporate VC. Those are unreachable from uh, some of the global investors. So these corporate VCs, they're actually industry players, right? So they're actually players within that ecosystem and supply chain, but stepping out and creating a financial product or a fund that allows investors to access almost like co-investment deals. Is that right? Maybe into M&A? Yeah, they have a fund structure and co-investment deal, and there is a strong alignment of interest. They hire professional investment manager to manage it. And then the firm itself, they would put in sometimes one third to half of the capital. So, so there is a strong alignment of interest and they do have a better access to those potential opportunity upstream or downstream, given they are some of the largest kind of like either buyer or seller to those companies. So I'm seeing huge opportunity in this space. And when China market rebound, those either upstream or downstream company will have expand exponential growth in the subsector. And those companies, because they are technology focused, will get a higher priority in listing either in Hong Kong or in China. So I think they are the future. If investor appetite, risk appetite is higher, they want the five, 10 backers. This type of corporate VC would be the place to be. There's a, an alignment of interest, but often if it's the player within the ecosystem, are they also doing transactions with their own firm? Because there's a little bit of connected party transaction there, right? Because they're, they might be an acquirer or they might actually be a part of the supply chain. How do investors navigate that? Because typically you should have an arm's length pricing when these assets are, are moved into the fund. Yeah, definitely. Elvin, this is a great question. And I think this is the first question that every single investor would ask when they invest in corporate VC. And this is a trend actually happened in global in US and Europe for many, many years. If you look at some of the big conglomerate, they do have their VC arm or investment arm, if you like. I think the solution is to create a proper investment committee, IC, in terms of corporate governance and hiring the external portfolio management team and then be transparent. So investor either investing in their commingo fund or co-investment would have access and deep kind of like transparency in the portfolio. And I would consider that it's a plus rather than a minus Then you invest in a blind pool private equity fund and you invest in a very diversified 20, 30 names. So I believe for investor, this type of corporate VC structure, if you can structure it in a better corporate governance way, would provide better opportunity to the investor. <laughs>